is a story about a time I caught 859 swans. coast of England, there is a rather unusual beach called Chesil Beach. It's an 18-mile bank of pebbles running parallel to the shore, trapping behind it a long, shallow lagoon of brackish water, so that's half salty, half fresh water, and that water is called the Fleet. The Fleet is home to the largest colony of mute swans in Britain, and the only managed mute swan colony in the world, Abbotsbury Swannery, and that is managed by Warden Charlie Wheeler. So why are there so many swans here at Abbotsbury? Uh, the main reason is the Fleet Lagoon. In the Fleet we have eelgrass, so there's acres and acres of eelgrass beds that grow within the Fleet. The Fleet is very shallow, only being about a metre deep, so it's basically the perfect habitat for swans. And we can have 12 to 1300 swans in the winter time uh, visiting the lagoon itself. They congregate down this end of the lagoon where we uh, are here um, because they nest down this end. And they nest down this end because the cygnets need fresh water when they're very, very young. So at Abbotsbury we have the only source of fresh water on the lagoon. In the 11th century, King Canute, of going for a paddle in the sea fame, founded a monastery in the village of Abbotsbury, and the monks there managed the swans to eat. Then Henry VIII came along, destroyed the monastery and bought up all the surrounding land, but he later sold it off to a private family, and that included handing over the crown's right to own any swans hatched at Abbotsbury. The Queen does have crown prerogative, I means she is able to claim any unclaimed swans. Isn't that right? There are only six species of swan in the entire world, and three of them, the mute swan, hooper swan, and buick swan, are native to the UK. Although these are called mute swans, they actually make a load of different vocalizations. They're just a lot quieter in comparison to the other types of swans. Black swans are not actually black mute swans. They're a completely different species. They come from Australia, completely different. Every two years in July, Abbotsbury Swannery catch all of the swans on the fleet. After building their nests and rearing their cygnets in spring and early summer, all of the adult swans undergo a moulting period, where they replace all their tattered feathers with fresh new ones ready for the year ahead. Now, luckily for us, this means that there is a narrow window in which all of the babies have grown up enough to be safely separated from the parents. But none of the adults have their flight feathers yet, so they can't fly away. And that is perfect time to catch some swans.
only one recorded death by swan. This was a kayaker in Chicago. Uh, he managed to kayak through a breeding pair, the, the most fighty and angry type of swans. And um, one of the swans capsized his kayak and then prevented him from reaching the shore, so he drowned. Swans cannot break your arm or leg. I mean, when they do attack, if they have to, if they're defending themselves, they'll attack with this bit, that essentially it's their wrist, the carpal joint. But because they've got to be so light to fly, even though this one's probably about 11 kilos, their bones are hollow, which means that they can't actually put that much force into their, into their attack. And look, you're quite calm, aren't you? Once all the swans are rounded up into the holding pens, it's time for everyone to grab a swan and take it round each of the stations to be counted, vaccinated and measured before release. Got it. Got it. Good. <laughs> You're a noisy little fella. I have to check your ring. Okay. What have we got here? White. It's white. Victor Hotel Hotel. Oh, another Abbott's Bruce swan. Is there a difference between white and yellow? White winged birds at Abbotsbury were hatched here. Yellow winged birds have come in from elsewhere. Ah. Okay, so this bird uh, wasn't um, hatched here at the swannery, so it's a, an incoming bird uh, from somewhere Foreigner. Else, a foreigner. Uh, and so, yeah, it gets a, a yellow ring uh, and a, a BTO ring, which is issued by the uh, British Trust for Ornithology. Cool. And what do the BTO do with all of this information about rings? So, um, yeah, the, the British Trust for Ornithology, they coordinate bird ringing. Um, in the UK and uh, they sort of administer the ring and, uh, rings and the database so by putting these rings on the birds we get to um, learn about their movements, uh, their survival. A new white one, sure. Uh, yeah we can learn um, if, uh, lots about movements, survival, uh, mortality um, just by putting these rings on, on the birds so yeah really useful data um, that can help um, conserve the species. There you go. Gonna give you a vaccination. What was it? Duck viral enteritis. Yeah. No stomach bugs for you. <laughs> Can you talk me through what you're doing at this stage? Yeah, and vaccinating them against duck viral enteritis. Um, so we check their feet for a condition called pododermatitis, which is also known as bumblefoot. And then we check their eyes for corneal ulceration and cataracts. Um, and then we check they haven't got anything stuck in their nostrils or their mouth um, and just their general condition. I think my rings are all good. That's the third one. Okay, let's get you weighed and measured. So what we're looking for on the age mm -hmm. is, are there any brown feathers okay. on the back? If there were any brown feathers, it would indicate that it's not entirely molted all its juvenile food. Gotcha. plumage because yeah. as you know no signets brown are brown and fluffy um, another thing to be looking for is the colour of the beak as mm. well and this is a nice nice pinky red beak oh. suggesting it's an older bird oh. and you've been calling out numbers when you open up their wings as well what's that? so what we're looking for there is what's known as a molt score so the birds at this time of year they molt all their flight feathers yeah. which is how we're able to catch them yeah. and they're in the process of regrowing new feathers which we'll see them through to next year and essentially they start off coming through and you can't see any feathering at all that's a malt score of zero uh -huh. then they have a tiny little bit of feather like a little bit of a paintbrush yeah. that's a malt score one and then that progresses up to a five where the new feathers are completely formed One way to tell the difference between a male and a female swan is the size. So males are about 12, 13 kilos, whereas females are about 9, 10 kilos. Also at certain times of the year, this little bit here, it's called the bill knob. Oh, it's all soft. Um, that changes size and uh, males usually have a bigger one, but it does change at different times of the year. The only really reliable way is to examine the cloaca, which is lovely. Andy, can you talk me through how you sex a swan? So, <laughs> carefully, you have to evert the cloaca and see what pops out. Oh, there it is. There, yeah. there it is, yeah. Yeah, so there is a phallus in there. Wildfowl have one. 
unlike most birds. Um, so you have to evert the cloaca until it pops out if there is one. Yeah. I've got you. Right, time to release. Time for you to join your brothers and sisters. It's all right, no need to be like that, honestly. There you go. And fly, my pretties, even though you can't fly. <laughs> Freedom! Perfect, one down, another five, six hundred to go. Easy. <laughs> How do you think that today's catch went? Yeah, pretty good. Um, so 859 is a pretty good count. Last year was just over 700. Um, our biggest count I think 946 or something like that. So we haven't quite reached a thousand before, but over 800 is a pretty good, pretty good number today. And yeah, went smoothly. Uh, all of the birds, we didn't have really any flew away, probably a dozen flew away. Um, so yeah, all in all a good day. And what have you noticed over the 30 years of working here? Is everything stayed pretty much the same or have things changed? Um, the overall population stays about the same, but of course, recently we've we've uh, we, you know occasionally get outbreaks of things like bird flu um but it's been a really good learning curve we at first they thought we we're going to lose all the swans but it just didn't happen it only targets certain age groups or um you know so it's never the devastating thing it used to be we've had lots of things come and go you know there's there's been years when the, the nesting populations are quite low other years they're really high survival rates can be low survival rates can be high it's you know ever since the oldest records go back way back the number of swans on the fleet has roughly been the same. And what have you found out from doing this over the years? Um, so just trying to get, as I said, a general snapshot of the, of the numbers so you can see whether some years are lower than others like that, it just depends. Um, and also, yeah, just, just we know that that, that vaccination has been done and that they are then covered for the next two years as well. They are somewhat understating the scientific importance of the Swan Roundup there. Having such detailed information about a semi-wild species over such a long period of time is both very rare and very useful. Based on data from the Abbotsbury swans, scientists have been able to calculate year-on-year -year survival rates for swans, at what age they first breed, what fraction of the population breeds in a year, that older birds are more likely to be immune to bird flu, suggesting that swans have a long-term immune memory, that there is selection for breeding earlier in life, even if that results in faster aging, with genetic evidence for that finding, the hormonal triggers for when swans molt their feathers, and direct evidence for evolution towards larger clutch sizes, including how much of that variance is due to the individual female, just to name a few papers. The Roundup is incredibly beneficial for both swans and swan scientists alike, but perhaps just perhaps, the real benefit was the feathery friends we made along the way. How did you get into being a swan? That was very interesting. Did you just tell the swan to smile? Yeah. <laughs> You're not a royal swan, are you? Oh, you are gorgeous. You are. Oh, you're my favourite. Don't tell the others, but you are my favourite. I want to say a huge thank you to Abbotsbury Swannery and Charlie Wheeler in particular for letting me take part and film in their craziest day of the year. Although the Roundup itself is a private event, the Swannery is a tourist attraction, and so you can go visit, get up close to the colony, and, you know, find out even more about swans. 